who have died. and we all share it, white and black. And we all should care for it too. Uncle Ozzy Cruz is a man now in his early 80s. And for any Aboriginal person to make it to your 80s or 90s is pretty extraordinary. He's lived through very difficult times, but his life is about social justice um, and peace for everyone, really. Cosy Osco, no, that's Targangel, mate. That Cory name for Cosy Osco, Targangel. The Bundian Way is a shared pathway and shared history, and we want our future people to share the, the, the pleasures of walking it. The Bundian Way is a 365 kilometre ancient cultural pathway used for tens of thousands of years, and it links Eden at the coast to the top of the Snowy Mountains, so the highest point of Australia down to the ocean. It was here that Aboriginal people first handed out the hand of friendship to non-Aboriginal people and said, come, we'll show the safest way up to the, to the, to the high country. Uncle's wider dream is for people of all cultures from around the world to come to that path of healing. When we sing about the mountains and we sing about the sea, we're singing about Bubba, we're singing about Gadu. We have to cross roads, make your choice. Like my uncle said, Gadu, raise your voice. Bring the noise, your uncle Ozzy Cruz has played such a, a fundamental role um, nationally and internationally for the rights of Aboriginal people. And I think the really important part of his work is what does it mean in his local community? What does it mean for the UN people? A lot of times they have problems because they, they don't know who they are and where they're at. But with Aboriginal people, the cults have been decimated so much and uh, the way of life has changed so rapidly that kids are really lost in that, in that, in that mire. <laughs> Oh, you reckon that? Man, it's just, <laughs> just, just those few days. Yep. yep. That's amazing, isn't it? Yep. Yep. His work now, trying to reconnect <laughs> youth to culture, I wanted to capture that story because it hasn't been captured and I felt it had to be and he is getting older, he's now 83 and he is one of our last great Aboriginal patriarchs. I was born in Victoria in 1933 in the Aboriginal section of the hospital. Um, they used to even brand the, the linen, the ABO and the ABO on it. My grandmothers were from the Gunai people and from the Monero people. And my grandfather was American Indian, so it's a pretty mixed up bunch of ancestors. Ozzy represents a generation that really understood absolutely what it was like back in the day for Aboriginal people who had no rights at all. Uncle's young life was really as with an itinerant family, doing what a lot of Aboriginal people did at that stage, um, the bean picking and working through farms and on the move. His schooling was pretty short-lived. He actually only did one day at high school and um, walked out in disgust after he was punished over something he didn't think was fair and never went back. He left school at 11 and then he really followed in his father's footsteps, fiercely independent and was an itinerant worker himself. He worked in the Torres Strait as a pearl diver, uh, you name it, uncle's done it. It was fairly commonplace for young people to drink. And um, I started drinking when I was 11, 12. I always worked hard, and, uh, but I drank hard. Mm. 
When I met Beryl, uh, she would have been about 14, I would have been about 15. We just clicked straight away. You know, we, we fell in love and made I tell you, that was the uh, most beautiful thing in my life. And they married in Nara in 1952. So they had three children. From when I was about five years old, we lived for 11 years in a tent, living on the riverbanks, traveling, pollen, the seasonal work. We always had a warm fire. Yeah. We always had food in our belly, and you know, it, was, it was a life that was suited to our, the way we were as Aboriginal people. The idea of the seasonal work was a lot to keep us moving, to keep us away from the welfare. And the welfare was stealing Aboriginal children for the stolen generation. The level of racism, segregation and just unrest with Aboriginal people at that time was building to a head. We in Eden used to call us quarter caste, half caste. White people always thought that black people were dirty and filthy and hygienic. Our three kids got sick, and so I took them into the Kempsey Hospital. And the kids had a long flying gowns on with ABO written across the front of them. And uh, I thought, wow, <laughs> we were out of here. I just grabbed the kids. We never even went and seen the, the people. We just took them and just took them out and went home. They wouldn't allow you to sit in the same picture theatres and wouldn't allow you to swim in the swimming pools and, and stay in any hotels or motels. So. It was something that happened there for a long time. Very few people knew that I was pretty well an alcoholic. And I used to drink like anything. It came out of a bottle, even including methylated spirits. There was a period also when it was illegal to sell alcohol to Aboriginal people. But yet alcohol was pretty, pretty much rife in our communities. Um, one thing that they didn't classify as alcohol was methylated spirits. He was a pretty violent man in his younger days. He was a very angry man. The seasonal work era finished. We drove to Sydney. It was the pug of Redfern pub. Here in the Empress Hotel Redfern, you'll see a few self-conscious black power salutes. There's a ferment among the young which could erupt at any time. He was a leader of a gang where they wore leather jackets and they called themselves the hounds. And to get into it, you had to, you had to drink a, a, a pint of rum without taking it away from your lips. By that time, I knew I was destroying my family because we had so little. Many times we were without food, and many times our clothing was just bare clothes. In fact, I remember the time I only had the clothes I was stood up in. And so Bill, she suffered all those years to hold the family together, hold the things together. Although she was a gambler too, see? She, was a, she loved playing cards. Bill was hooked on that. Uncle said that he was in a very dark place, still having to deal with terrible racism, battling alcoholism. And he said that if he hadn't found Christ and converted to Christianity, there would have been bloodshed. There are thousands of churches throughout the United States that are praying that a spirit of spiritual awakening will sweep throughout Australia. 1962, so he would have been 29, he went to a Billy Graham crusade and changed his ways after that. He just changed overnight. He stopped swearing, he stopped drinking, he, he, he became a very um, peaceful man. When we both became Christians, I left grog and she left gambling. We never, never, never looked back, never, never went near those things ever again. So, yeah, it was, it was a miracle, a miracle change. Ozzy became a preacher. He would organise church groups in the bean paddocks all over from Queensland, Victoria, into South Australia as they travelled around. God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. 
many Aboriginal people were able to incorporate uh, Christian religion and values into their lives without uh, it usurping their Aboriginality and culture. The stars are his handiwork too. One of the questions that always comes up to me is, how do you equate Aboriginal culture with white man's religion? And um, I wrestled with that for a long time. The Bible tells us that God... I always knew that we knew God. His name was Muriel. Muriel became to me the same God as the white man's God. After becoming a Christian, he then dove into a very proactive political and social life. And the first issue wasn't land rights. It was never land rights, it was, it was civil rights. People wanted to be known as, a, as another human being. So it was just making sure that Aboriginal people had um, access to healthcare and had proper wages. And then his big focus was housing. Many of these live on the outskirts of country centres, in groups of shanties, in settlements and missions close to towns, and in groups in depressed parts of urban areas. Making sure that itinerant workers were able to transition from humpies to caravans to housing. He was the one who really secured the first house in Bega for an Aboriginal family, and he just describes it as complete pandemonium, because <laughs> the white community didn't want that. There was just huge resistance, and Uncle just stayed the course and just kept chipping away and just kept fighting for the rights. We needed leadership. People like Ozzy Cruz stood up and, and took up that mantle of leadership, and, um, and they certainly paved the way for many of us young ones. It was an overwhelming yes, the biggest yes vote ever, all the states and 90% of the people, a historic leap forward. Aborigines, at last, were citizens in their own land. He started his political work uh, in a big way in 1968, after the 67 referendum. He was involved in the biggest social and land rights and federal bodies in our history. People's knowledge of Aboriginal history is kind of limited, I guess, to the Freedom Rides and uh, the Aboriginal Embassy. Um, and they're very important ish turning points, I think. With Aussie, um, he's more a, a man working in the background on practical matters to help change things at a practical level. He's working on legislation, advising on all different levels. He's often seen as the one opposing the radicals. Coming from a militant background, you say, oh, why write a letter, you know, or write, do a resolution? Let's just go and do it, you know. Um, whereas people like Ozzy was able to say, no, 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 there is a pathway here, and we will meet face to face with these people and saying, if this doesn't happen, you're just fueling a fire out there on the streets. And, and so he had that capacity to be able to have politicians come to the table and sit around and then they, they'd listen. Work that we were doing during the 80s under the Fraser government was land rights, federal land rights, and a treaty. And he went on an overseas delegation with Gough Whitlam and Michael Anderson to talk to heads of government about infringement of human rights against Australian Aboriginal people. The delegation plans to tell African leaders Australia denies Aborigines self-determination. Mr Whitlam's coming along as our diplomatic advisor. We're... The idea was then that we would take all these wrongs to black nations for them to ask the questions of the Australian government. Why are you doing these things? to these black people. It was an incredible trip because we did not meet anybody other than the pre prime ministers, the presidents, and they paid due, due regard to us and, and they treated it with a proper, as a proper diplomatic mission. But the issues were immense yeah, you know, when we were talking about things. And when we took a, a submission to the United Nations, uh, it was our submission really that sparked off the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. We were, we were getting closer and closer to things happening as a whole, as a people. What lessons does one take as a, as a member of the federal parliament from someone like, um, like Uncle Ozzy? And it is that quiet leadership. It is that 
understanding that uh, persuasion is not about thumping the table and um, yelling at people. Persuasion is often long and arduous, quiet and persistent. We'll use most of that. You start mixing the centre like that. You must have it nice and wet. It doesn't matter if it's over wet. Uncle's house in Eden is a hub for family and culture. See how it's, how it's flattened out? And the door is always open to a constant flow of family and friends. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for the fellowship of this meal. Amen. Amen. OK, now this Aboriginal fry bread. And honey. We had an assignment to do and it was with who we think is a famous Australian and I actually chose Pop to do it with because he's like had a big impact on my life. He got these three presented to him by the Queen. He's met Kathy Freeman, he's like even flew to Hawaii to see like the president over there. Yeah he just gets to do so much stuff. Uncle would agree that it was God and Beryl who saved his life and gave his whole life shape and meaning. To live with a person like Beryl wasn't hard. She was a, she was a woman of really strong character and she kept you on the straight and narrow, kept me on the straight and narrow. To celebrate, you know, Nan and Pop's 60th anniversary and all the family got together and put on a big surprise party from Nana Pop. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, I mean. That's good from your heart. Mm. Nana gave me the cards from the Queen, what she got for their wedding anniversary. She was pretty proud of it. <laughs> it was just so beautiful to sit down with all those children, our children. You know, we had something, at that time we had something like 40, 47 great-grandchildren. and. Uh, and one great great, I think it was. Probably about six months later, Nan passed away. I used to sing that song, He, he Is Our Peace. He's broken down every wall, and she'd go to sleep while I sing that. And it was there, and then when she said to me, I love you, I said, Don't say that. Don't say that to me. And I said, because everyone who said I love you died. Everyone. Hey! Naturally, he wasn't doing too well. Obviously missed that a lot. So we made a collective decision as a family to kind of move in there with him. It's a pretty lonely place when you're, a, you're an old bachelor um, and uh, you've lost your... your your treasured wife. I didn't want to be on planet Earth no more. And uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm out of this place. I'm, I'm going where she is. But within a fortnight, I had a phone call from a fellow with a caravan park, and he said, Oz, see, there's a girl over here sleeping on a bit of canvas. Can you do anything for us? So immediately my, my attention was drawn straight to help that young lady. Because I've seen him go out late at night and early in the morning, all hours of the day, just to help people. Could be, you could get another shower, boy, get your jumper. Yeah, he went to the doctor's on Thursday. Yeah, are you all right? They described him ADHD. Did he need medication or anything? Yeah, he's on it now. For me life, I've known Uncle Oz. He's seen my kids grow up and now they're going to Sunday school like we used to when we were kids. You don't want to go, Pop. Oh. Yeah, he's not happy. He's not well. My boy, where is he? He's my best boy. Uncle Oz is the one that you can talk to and be there and, and he'll walk beside you as long as you need him. You're going to be right. You're with, with Pop now. Come on. I'll look after you, boy. Yeah, that's the magazine, that's the new ones. This is Bellbird Hill. This area has been fairly notorious for being a difficult area. Good morning, young fellas. This church has always been a sort of a refuge for kids and it's always been a home for them. They come for breakfast. Do we go to Jigami on Monday on the first week back to school? 
yeah. and Uncle Ozzy, he's just been like a grandfather to them. And the youth camp that he wants to develop, um, that's an extension of that, a more permanent thing. Um, that'll operate when he's dead and gone. Mm. Welcome, lads. Yeah. Good stuff, lads. Yeah. His dream is to create a space where people, um, black and white, can come and actually learn about and reconnect with Aboriginal culture. Thank you for coming and we can't stand here talking all day. We've got things to do on these guys. Again. And more critically, making sure that troubled youth and youth that are lost to drugs and booze and are really disenfranchised and broken can come to a safe place. Not just Indigenous kids, but a lot of kids do need just a place to go to, and this is um, this provides a really nice uh, place for them. He wants to use this opportunity to train Koori youth and give them building skills. The kids are actually building their own youth camp. It's going to be a program that's aimed at giving young people self-esteem, and so our program will be developed to link in with the Bundian Way that made the pathway that runs 380 kilometres up to Kosciuszko. And that place where the youth camp is, is the gateway. And the Bunjian Way has been lost, really, for a couple of hundred years. But BJ Crew's uncle's son can always remember his father talking about wanting to find these ancestral pathways. And the Bunjian Way um, became a focus of research for Uncle, and then historian and author John Blay became involved. This part of the country here has more evidence of our people living in it. Than I started gathering the old parish maps for this region and started to find that the first surveyors in the 1830s and 40s had marked the old Aboriginal pathways and they were often followed by the settlers. Yeah. It is an extraordinary midden, isn't it, also? It is. You never guess how old it is. A thousand of years old. The Aboriginal people showed the first settlers how to safely get up onto you know, a country that, that they could live on, not knowing that they were going to put up barbed wire fences and shut the Aboriginal out. And we're okay. walking on an old track yeah. that people yeah. have probably used for thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is the old pathway. I walked through and found a whole lot of stuff, and I was really excited about it. You can see middens all the way around the coast. You can see artefacts. There's nearby. There's a scarred tree, which, with one archaeologist, looked at it closely and said to me, "Look, there's 17 different generations of marking on this tree." some with a stone axe. This is the first stage of the Bundian Way. They're really positive about that Bundian Way as an entity being opened within the next couple of years. This country around here is, is you know, it's virgin country, really. In the meantime, they opened a symbolic story trail. Identify John, basically where the last corroboree took place. It opens up the whole world to the indigenous community and the way we lived and stuff like that, so it's, yeah, it's real good. It gives everybody an insight to our culture and the way we lived. We're the four-man worker now, all Aboriginal worker. We're actually building a Bundian way. It's all about to the human side of it, you see, you've got these young men that have been out of work, and it's a tremendous <laughs> boost to their self-worth. My partner, I've got three kids to her. She passed away in July last year. Yeah, and Uncle Ozzie was pretty much well, he was the first person there for me. Yeah, he done everything for me. That's the final bit the mountain on the on the coast. Isn't it? Ozzie yeah. says yeah. it's a pathway that joins us yeah. together. Yeah. The Bunny Way is his gift to the people, the white fellas and the black fellas. Pop was a delegate at a conference in Uluru recently. He said he didn't want to fly anymore. I said, I'm getting too old. So I offered to drive him. Hundreds are gathered here in the shadow of Uluru at Mutajulu for the opening of a constitutional convention. In 1967, we were counted. 
In 2017, we seek to be heard and we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Well, I mean, I've heard all these things he's done from 30, 40 years ago, and I've heard all these names to actually see the looks on their faces when they saw each other, the laugh and the embrace, that was, that was, yeah, the most, that was the magical part for me. We were having to achieve the, the freedom of our people in Australia. Even though lots of times you take three steps, two backwards, but you've gained one. Keep going, just keep going. Many of his generation are no longer with us. But what a legacy they gave us. And they saw some terrible things and experienced some terrible things. And we should be forever grateful for them. ABC and I view four corners or an ABC.